Book 16. These two in the shelter, Odysseus and the noble swineherd, stirred the fire at dawn, and arranged their breakfast, and sent the herdsmen out with the pasturing pigs. At this time the clamorous dogs came fawning around Telemachos, nor did they bark at him as he came, and great Odysseus noticed that the dogs were fawning, above them he heard the loud noise of footsteps. Immediately he spoke in winged words to Eumaios, Eumaios, someone is on his way here who is truly one of yours, or else well known, since the dogs are not barking but fawning about him, and I can hear the thud of his footsteps. His whole word had not been spoken when his beloved son stood in the forecourt. Amazed, the swineherd started up, and the vessels, where he had been busily mixing the bright wine, fell from his hand. He came up to meet his master, and kissed his head, and kissed too his beautiful shining eyes, and both his hands, and the swelling tear fell from him. And as a father, with heart full of love, welcomes his only and grown son, for whose sake he has undergone many hardships when he comes back in the tenth year from a distant country, so now the noble swineherd, clinging fast to godlike Telemachos, kissed him even as if he had escaped dying, and in a burst of weeping he spoke to him in winged words, You have come, Telemachos, sweet light, I thought I would never see you again, when you had gone in the ship to Pylos. But come now into the house, dear child, so that I can pleasure my heart with looking at you again when you are inside, for you do not come very often to the estate and the herdsmen, but you stay in town, since now it seems you are even minded to face the deadly company of the lordly suitors. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, So it shall be, my father, but it was for your sake I came here, to look upon you with my eyes, and to hear a word from you, whether my mother endures still in the halls, or whether some other man has married her, and the bed of Odysseus lies forlorn of sleepers with spider webs grown upon it. Then in turn the swineherd, leader of men, said to him, All too much with enduring heart she does wait for him there in your own palace, and always with her the wretched nights and the days also waste her away with weeping. So he spoke, and took the bronze spear from him. Telemachos then went inside and stepped over the sill of stone, and his father Odysseus rose from his seat and yielded him place as he entered, but Telemachos from the other side checked him and said to him, No, sit, my friend, and we shall find us another seat, here in our own shelter, the man is here who will lay it for us. He spoke, and Odysseus went back again and sat down. The swineherd strewed green brushwood and fleeces on the ground for him. There the beloved son of Odysseus seated himself, and for them the swineherd brought and set beside them platters of roasted meat, which they had left over when they were eating earlier, and hastily set bread by them, piling it in baskets, and mixed the wine, as sweet as honey, in a bowl of ivy. He himself sat down across from godlike Odysseus. They put forth their hands to the good things that lay ready before them. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, then at last Telemachos questioned the noble swineherd, Father, where did this stranger come from? How did the sailors bring him to Ithaca? What men do they claim that they are? For I do not think he could have travelled on foot to this country. Then, O swineherd Eumaios, you said to him in answer, So, my child, I will relate you the whole true story. He announces himself by birth to be one from spacious Crete, but his wanderings have wheeled him through many cities of mortal men, for so the divinity spun his thread for him, and now this time he has fled away off a ship of the Sprotian men, and come to my steading. I put him into your hands now. Do with him as you will. He names himself your suppliant. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, Eumaios, this word you spoke hurt my heart deeply. For how shall I take and entertain a stranger guest in my house? I myself am young and have no faith in my hand's strength to defend a man, if anyone else picks a quarrel with him, and my mother's heart is divided in her, and ponders two ways, whether to remain here with me, and look after the household, keep faith with her husband's bed, and regard the voice of the people, or go away at last with the best man of the Achaeans who pays her court in her palace, and brings her the most presents. But as for this stranger, since it is your house he has come to, I will give him a mantle and tunic to wear, fine clothing, and give him sandals for his feet, a sword with two edges, and send him wherever his heart and spirit desire to be sent. Or if you will, keep him here in your steading and look after him, and I will send the clothes out here, and all provisions to eat, so he will not be hard on you, nor on your companions, but I will not let him go down there and be where the suitors are, for their outrageousness is too strong, and I fear they may insult him, and that will be a hard sorrow upon me and a difficult one for even a strong man to deal with among too many of them, since they will be far the stronger. 
Then long-suffering great Odysseus spoke to him in answer, Dear friend, since in truth I am privileged to speak of this, you eat away the dear heart in me, as I listen to what you tell of the suitors and their reckless contrivings inside your palace, against your will, when you are such a one as you are. Tell me, are you willingly oppressed by them? Do the people hate you throughout this place, swayed by some impulse given from the gods? Do you find your brothers wanting? A man trusts help from these in the fighting when a great quarrel arises. I wish that I were truly as young as I am in spirit, or a son of stately Odysseus were here, or he himself might come in from his wandering. There is time still for hope. If such things could be, another could strike my head from my shoulders if I did not come as an evil thing to all those people as I entered the palace of Odysseus, the son of Let's. And if I, fighting alone, were subdued by all their number, then I would rather die, cut down in my own palace, than have to go on watching forever these shameful activities, guests being battered about, or to see them rudely mishandling the serving women all about the beautiful palace, to see them drawing the wine and eating up food in this utterly reckless way, without end, forever and always at it. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, So, my friend, I will tell you plainly the whole truth of it. It is not that all the people hate me, nor are they angry, nor is it that I find brothers wanting, whom a man trusts for help in the fighting, whenever a great quarrel arises. For so it is that the son of Cronos made ours a single line. Archesios had only a single son, Laertes, and Laertes had only one son, Odysseus, Odysseus in turn left only one son, myself, in the halls, and got no profit of me, and my enemies are here in my house, beyond numbering. For all the greatest men who have the power in the islands, in Dulition and same and in wooded Zakynthos, and all who in rocky Ithaca are holders of lordships, all these are after my mother for marriage, and wear my house out. And she does not refuse the hateful marriage, nor is she able to make an end of the matter, and these eating up my substance waste it away, and soon they will break me myself to pieces. Yet all these are things that are lying upon the gods' knees. Father Eumaios, go quickly now, and tell the circumspect Penelope that I am safe and have come from Pylos. I myself will stay here. You go there quickly, and give this message to her alone, and let no other Achaean hear it, for there are many there who are plotting against me. Then, O swineherd Eumaios, you said to him in answer, I see, I understand, you speak to one who follows you. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. Shall I on the same errand go with the news to wretched Laertes, who while he so greatly grieved for Odysseus yet would look after his farm and with the thralls in his household would eat and drink, whenever the spirit was urgent with him, but now, since you went away in the ship to Pylos, they say he has not eaten in this way, nor drunk anything, nor looked to his farm, but always in lamentation and mourning sits grieving, and the flesh on his bones is wasting from him. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, though it hurts the more, we shall let him be, for all our sorrow. For if it were somehow given to mortals to have their choosing in all things, we should choose my father's day of homecoming. But you, when you have given your message, come back and do not go off to the estate to see him, but tell my mother to tell the servant who is housekeeper to go there swiftly and secretly, and she can give the news to the old man. He spoke, and started the swineherd, who in his hands took up his sandals and tied them on his feet to start for the city. Nor was Athene unaware that Eumaios the swineherd had left the steading, but she came near, likened to a woman beautiful and tall, and skilled in glorious handiwork, and stood in the forecourt of the shelter, seen by Odysseus. But Telemachos did not look her way nor did he perceive her, for the gods do not show themselves in this way to everyone, but Odysseus saw her and the dogs did, they were not barking, but cowered away, whimpering, to the other side of the shelter. She nodded to him with her brows, and noble Odysseus saw her, and came from the house, outside the great wall of the courtyard, and stood in her presence. Then Athene spoke to him, saying, Son of Let's and Seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, it is time now to tell your son the story, no longer hide it, so that, contriving death and doom for the suitors, you too may go to the glorious city. I myself shall not be long absent from you in my eagerness for the fighting. So spoke Athene, and with her golden wand she tapped him. First she made the mantle and the tunic that covered his chest turn bright and clean, she increased his strength and stature. His dark color came back to him again, his jaws firmed, and the beard that grew about his chin turned black. Athene went away once more, having done her work, but Odysseus went back into the shelter. His beloved son was astonished and turned his eyes in the other direction, fearing this must be a god, 
and spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, suddenly you have changed, my friend, from what you were formerly, your skin is no longer as it was, you have other clothing. Surely you are one of the gods who hold the high heaven. Be gracious, then, so we shall give you favoured offerings and golden gifts that have been well wrought. Only be merciful. Then in turn long-suffering great Odysseus answered him, No, I am not a god. Why liken me to the immortals? But I am your father, for whose sake you are always grieving as you look for violence from others, and endure hardships. So he spoke, and kissed his son, and the tears running down his cheeks splashed on the ground. Until now, he was always unyielding. But Telemachos, for he did not yet believe that this was his father, spoke to him once again in answer, saying, No, you are not Odysseus my father, but some divinity beguiles me, so that I must grieve the more, and be sorry. For no man who was mortal could ever have so contrived it by his own mind alone, not unless some immortal, descending on him in person, were likely to make him a young or an old man. For even now you were an old man in unseemly clothing, but now you resemble one of the gods who hold wide heaven. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, Telemachos, it does not become you to wonder too much at your own father when he is here, nor doubt him. No other Odysseus than I will ever come back to you. But here I am, and I am as you see me, and after hardships and suffering much I have come, in the twentieth year, back to my own country. But here you see the work of Athene, the giver of plunder, who turns me into whatever she pleases, since she can do this, and now she will make me look like a beggar, but then the next time like a young man, and wearing splendid clothes on my body, and it is a light thing for the gods who hold wide heaven to glorify any mortal man, or else to degrade him. So he spoke, and sat down again, but now Telemachos folded his great father in his arms and lamented, shedding tears, and desire for mourning rose in both of them, and they cried shrill in a pulsing voice, even more than the outcry of birds, ospreys or vultures with hooked claws, whose children were stolen away by the men of the fields, before their wings grew strong, such was their pitiful cry and the tears their eyes wept. And now the light of the sun would have set on their crying, had not Telemacho spoken a quick word to his father, what kind of ship was it, father dear, in which the sailors brought you to Ithaca? What men do they claim that they are? For I do not think you could have travelled on foot to this country. Then long-suffering great Odysseus said to him in answer, So, my child, I will tell you all the truth. The Phaeacians famed for seafaring brought me here, and they carry other people as well, whoever may come into their country. They brought me sleeping in their fast ship over the open sea, and set me down in Ithaca, and gave me glorious gifts, abundant bronze and gold and woven apparel. All this, by the gods' grace, is lying stored in the caverns. But now I have come to this place by the advice by Athene, so we together can make our plans to slaughter our enemies. Come then, tell me the number of suitors, and tell me about them, so I can know how many there are, and which men are of them, and then, when I have pondered it in my faultless mind, I can decide whether we two alone will be able to face them without any help, or whether we must go looking for others. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, Oh, father, I have always heard of your great fame, and how you were a fighting man with your hands, and prudent in counsel, but what you have spoken of is too big, I am awed, for it could not be that two men could fight against strong men in these numbers. The suitors are no simple number of ten, nor twice that, but far more than that. Even now you shall hear the number of those that are here. From Dulition there are two and fifty young men, choice men, and there are six thralls of their following, the number of men come from same is four and twenty, and from Zakynthos there are twenty sons of the Achaeans. From Ithaca itself there are twelve, and all of their best men, and Medan the herald is with them, and the divine singer, and there are two henchmen with them, both skilled in carving. If we set ourselves to fight against all who are in the palace, I fear your revenge on their violence may be grim and bitter for us. Then, if you can think of anyone to stand by us and with forthright spirit be our protector, speak of him to me. Then in turn long-suffering great Odysseus answered him, So, then, I will tell you. Hear me and understand me and consider whether Athene with Zeus' father helping will be enough for us, or whether I must think of some other helper. Then the thoughtful Telemacho said to him in answer, Those indeed are two excellent helpers you name to me, even though they sit high away in the clouds, for they have power over others besides, over mortal men and the gods immortal. Then in turn long-suffering great Odysseus answered him, These are two who will not for a long time stay far off from the strong battle, at that time when the war god's decision is fought out in our halls between ourselves and the suitors. 
but now, as for you, you must make your way, when dawn shows, back to our house, and be with the group of insolent suitors. At a later time the swineherd shall take me to the city, and I shall look like a dismal vagabond, and an old man. But if they maltreat me within the house, then let the dear heart in you even endure it, though I suffer outrage, even if they drag me by the feet through the palace to throw me out of it, or pelt me with missiles, you must still look on and endure it, though indeed you may speak to them with soft words and entreat them to give over their mad behaviour, but still they will never listen to you, for the day of their destiny stands near them. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. When Athene, lady of many counsels, puts it into my mind, I will nod my head to you, and when you perceive it, take all the warlike weapons which are stored in the great hall, and carry them off and store them away in the inward corner of the high chamber, and when the suitors miss them and ask you about them, answer and beguile them with soft words, saying, I stored them away out of the smoke, since they are no longer like what Odysseus left behind when he went to Troy land, but are made foul. With all the smoke of the fire upon them, also, the son of Kronos put into my head this even greater thought, that with the wine in you, you might stand up and fight, and wound each other, and spoil the feast and the courting, since iron all of itself works on a man and attracts him. But leave behind, for you and me alone, a pair each of swords and spears, and a pair of oxide shields, to take up in our hands, and wield them, and kill these men, and Zeus of the councils and Pallas Athene will be there to maze the wits in them. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. If truly you are my own son, and born of our own blood, then let nobody hear that Odysseus is in the palace, let not let's hear of it, neither let the swine herd, let no one in the household know, not even Penelope herself, you and I alone will judge the faith of the women, and, besides these, we can make trial of the serving men, to see whether any of them is true to us and full of humility, or whether one cares nothing for you, and denies your greatness. Then in answer again his glorious son said to him, Father, I think you will learn what my spirit is like, when the time comes, for the mood that is in my mind shows no slackening, only I think in what you propose there will be no profit for either of us, and I urge you to think well about it. You would be going about our holdings, testing and learning the nature of man after man, while they at their ease in the palace overbearingly consume our goods, and spare nothing. And yet I do urge you to find out about the women, which of them care nothing for you, and which are innocent, but I myself would not wish that we should go out to the steadings to test the men, but this is a task to be left for later, if truly you have been given some sign from Zeus of the Aegis. Now as these two were conversing thus with each other, the well-made vessel which had carried Telemachos, together with his companions, from Pylos, now came into Ithaca. They, when they were inside the many hollowed harbour, hauled the black hulled ship onto the dry land, high up, and their high hearted henchmen carried their armour for them, and took the beautiful presents to the house of Clitios. But they sent a herald on his way to the house of Odysseus to take a message to circumspect Penelope, saying Telemachos was in the country now, but had told them to sail the ship back to the city, so the magnificent queen would not be terrified within her heart, and shed the soft tears. The two of them met, the herald and noble swineherd, going by reason of the same message, to report to the lady. But when they had come to the house of the sacred king, the herald stood in the midst of the serving maids and delivered his message, Now, O queen, your beloved son is back in this country. But the swineherd stood very close to Penelope and told her all the message that her beloved son had entrusted to him to tell, but when he had given her all the message, he went back to his pigs, leaving the palace and courtyard. But the hearts of the suitors were disturbed and discouraged. They went out of the palace and stood by the great wall of the courtyard, and there in front of the palace gates they held an assembly. First of them to speak was Eurymachos, son of Polybos, friends, this is a monstrous thing, this voyage made by Telemachos and insolently put through. We thought he would never achieve it. But come, let us drag a black ship, our best one, down to the water, and assemble sailors to row it, who can with all speed carry the message to give to our others and tell them to come home quickly. He had not yet said all before Amphinomos, turning from his place, saw the ship inside the depths of the harbour, and they had the oars now in their hands and were taking the sails down. He laughed out sweetly and spoke a word then to his companions, we need send them no message now. Here they are, inside. Either some god told it to them, or they themselves saw the other ship pass by, and they were not able to catch her. He spoke, and they stood up and went down to the sand of the seashore, and others hauled their black hulled ship up onto the dry land, and their high hearted henchmen carried their armor for them. They went in a throng to the assembly, nor did they suffer any of the young men or any of the elders to sit with them. 
Thereupon Antinous, son of Eupethes, addressed them, It is shameful how the gods got this man clear of misfortune. In the daytime we sat watchful along the windy headlands, always succeeding each other, but when the sun set, we never lay through the night on the dry land, but always on the open water, cruising in a fast ship, we waited for the divine dawn, watching to ambush Telemachos, so that we could cut him off, but all the time some divinity brought him home. Therefore, we who are here must make our plans for the grim destruction of Telemachos, so he cannot escape us, since I have no thought we can get our present purpose accomplished while he is living. For he himself is understanding in thought and counsel, and the people here no longer show us their entire favour. But come now, before he can gather the Achaeans and bring them to assembly, for I think he will not let us go, but work out his anger, and stand up before them all and tell them how we designed his sudden murder, but we could not catch him, and they will have no praise for us when they hear of our evil deeds, and I fear they will work some evil on us, and drive us from our own country, so we must make for another community, then let us surprise him and kill him, in the fields away from the city or in the road, and ourselves seize his goods and possessions, dividing them among ourselves fairly, but give his palace to his mother to keep and to the man who marries her. Or else, if what I say is not pleasing to you, but you are determined to have him go on living and keep his father's inheritance, then we must not go on gathering here and abundantly eating away his fine substance, but from his own palace each man must strive to win her with gifts of courtship, she will then marry the man she is fated to have, and who brings her the greatest presents. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence. Now Amphinomo spoke forth and addressed them. He was the shining son of Nisos, son of the Lord Aresiates, and led those suitors who had come over from the abundant grasslands and grainlands of Dulition, and pleased Penelope more than the others in talk, for he had good sense and discretion. He in kind intention toward all spoke forth and addressed them, Dear friends, I for my part would not be willing to murder Telemachos, it is terrible to kill one of royal blood, we should first have to ask the gods for their counsel. Then, if the ordinances of great Zeus approve of it, I myself would kill him and tell all others to do so, but I say we must give it up, if the gods deny us. So Amphinomo spoke, and his word was acceptable to them. Then they stood up at once and went into the house of Odysseus, and entering they found their polished chairs, and were seated. But now circumspect Penelope thought of her next move, to show herself to her overbearingly violent suitors, for she had heard how they had planned her son's death in the palace. The herald, Medan, who overheard their planning, had told her. She went with her attendant women into the great hall. But when she, shining among women, came to the suitors, she stood by the pillar that supported the roof with its joinery, holding her shining veil in front of her face to shield it, and spoke a word of reproach to Antinous, naming him, Antinous, violent man, deviser of evil, in Ithaca the common account says you are the best man among your age mates for speech and counsel. But you have never been such. Oh, boisterous creature, why do you weave a design of death and destruction for Telemachos, and take no heed of suppliants, over whom Zeus stands witness? It is not right to plan harm for each other. Do you not know how your father came here once, a fugitive in fear of the people? These were terribly angered with him, because he had thrown in his lot with the pirate Taphians and harried the Thesprotians, and these were friends of our people. They wanted to waste him away, to break the dear heart in him, to eat up his substance and abundant livelihood. Only Odyssea stayed their hand and held them, for all their fury. Now you eat up his house without payment, pay court to his wedded wife, try to murder his son, and do me great indignity. I tell you to stop it, and ask the others to do so likewise. Eurymachos the son of Polybo spoke then answering, daughter of Icarios, circumspect Penelope, do not fear. Never let your heart be troubled for these things. The man is not living, nor will there be one, nor can there ever be one, who shall lay hands upon your son, Telemachos, as long as I am alive on earth and look on the daylight. For I tell you this straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished, instantly his own black blood will stain my spear point. My own spear, since often Odysseus, sacker of cities, would seat me also upon his knees, and put pieces of roasted meat in my hands, and hold the red wine out to me. Therefore, of all men Telemachos is the dearest to me by far, and I tell him to go in no fear of destruction from the suitors. But if it comes from the gods, there is no escaping it. So he spoke, encouraging her, but himself was planning the murder. She went back to the shining upper chamber and wept for Odysseus, her dear husband, until the grey-eyed goddess Athene drifted a sweet sleep over her eyelids. 
with the evening, the noble swineherd came back to Odysseus and his son. Then they stood over the evening meal to prepare it, and dedicated a year-old sow, but meanwhile Athene had come and stood close by Odysseus, son of Laertes, and tapped him with her wand and made him once more an old man, and put foul clothing upon his skin, for fear the swineherd might recognize him, face to face, and go with the message to circumspect Penelope, and not keep fast the secret. Now Telemachos was the first who spoke a word to him, so, noble Eumaios, you have come. And what was the rumor in the town? Are the haughty suitors now back from their ambush, or are they still lying in wait for me on my homeward journey? Then, O oh swineherd Eumaios, you said to him in answer, it was not on my mind to go down through the city, nor to ask, nor try to find out, rather the will was urgent within me to speak my message with all speed and be on my way back here. But one of your fellows as a swift messenger joined my company, the herald, he was the first who told the word to your mother. But here is another thing I know, with my eyes I saw it. I was above the city, where the hill of Hermes is, making my way along, when I saw a fast vessel coming into our harbour, making inshore, and many men were aboard her, and she was loaded with shields and leaf-headed spears. Then I thought that these would be the men we mean, but I do not know it. So he spoke, and Telemachos, the hallowed prince, smiled as he caught his father's eye, but avoided the eyes of the swineherd. They, when they had finished their work and got their feast ready, feasted, nor was any man's hunger denied a fair portion. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, they thought of going to bed, and accepted the gift of slumber. 